compression is an effect that I personally only know from my DAW. I've never touched a hardware compressor, much less an analog one, which makes it all the more intriguing to try and design one myself. Since I never bothered to really understand the plugin I was using, I just tweaked the settings until I liked what I heard. The obvious first step was to take a closer look at what it actually does to a waveform. For that, I recorded this beat from my drum machine. As you can hear, the levels are all messed up. The kick is way too loud, while the hats and toms are super quiet. You can even see this in the waveform itself. These big white bumps are the kick and snare, while hats and toms only show up as smaller blips. And here's what that same clip sounds like when I activate the compressor. Suddenly, the kick and snare aren't that loud anymore. You can clearly see this in the waveform as well. The bumps are much smaller than before. Curiously, the small blips stayed the same volume though, so it's not like we simply reduced the overall volume of the clip. Instead, we somehow specifically reduced only the volume of the kick and snare hits, making our beats mix much more balanced as a result. Cool, but how does this work? How does the plugin know which parts of the clip are too loud, and how does it turn them down selectively? The magic control for this is the compression threshold. If I drag it up all the way, we can see that the clip goes back to its initial state. And that's because that compression threshold is what the plugin uses to decide if a sound is too loud and subsequently where that needs to turn down the output volume. If you're having trouble visualizing this, here's a quick illustration. Up top, we have our input waveform and the original compression threshold and below it, the compressor's output. As you can see, all the parts that cross the threshold up top are significantly reduced in volume below. Though interestingly, they still cross it in the result. Why is that? Because of the compressor's ratio setting, which tells it by how much it should reduce the volume when the input crosses the threshold. At the moment, that setting is dialed to a pretty moderate level. That's why the compressor doesn't simply cut off the signal at the threshold. If we crank it up all the way though, that's precisely what happens. The threshold turns into a brick wall that the output cannot cross. And conversely, if we turn the ratio down fully, the input is left completely untouched. There are two more controls that I regularly use when working with a compressor. First up, there's the attack time, which tells the compressor how long it should wait before reducing the output volume. Right now, it's turned down completely, so the volume is reduced the instance the signal crosses the threshold. Let's turn it up and see what happens. As expected, the compressor now lets the signal push beyond the threshold for a moment before proceeding to squash it. And as I turn up the attack further, that waiting period gets even longer. Finally, let's look at the release control, which is basically the symmetrical counterpart to the attack control. It tells the compressor how long it should wait before restoring the output volume. At the moment, it's turned down completely, so the volume is restored the instance the signal falls back below the threshold. Let's try to bump this one up too. As you can see, the parts of the waveform that directly follow the big bumps are now affected even though they don't cross the threshold. Cool, so for a very basic little compressor circuit, these are the four features I definitely want to replicate. Compression threshold, compression ratio, attack, and release. To make our lives a bit easier, we'll start by singling out the compression threshold. Conceptually, here's how I think it could be implemented. First up, we need a block that allows us to manipulate the volume of our input signal. Since this has to happen automatically, we'll want a solution that can be controlled with a voltage. Next, we need to know how loud the output of that first block currently is. This might sound like a pretty simple question, but it's not exactly trivial to answer. We'll get to that in a bit. After this, we need to compare the current volume level to a threshold and determine if we're above or below it and by how much. Finally, we want to use this information to control the output volume of our first block. 
This way, we establish a feedback loop that works something like this. At any given moment, we ask, how loud is the output signal? Then, is it louder than the set threshold? If yes, then reduce the output volume. If no, leave it as is. This way, we get something akin to the brick wall compression we've seen earlier, where the compression threshold is basically a hard volume ceiling. This is also called limiting, by the way. Cool. Now, in order to turn this idea into an actual circuit, we'll need to come up with implementations for these three individual blocks. Let's start with volume modulation. If you've been following this channel for a while, you might already be thinking in a certain direction here. As was I. Which is why I decided to go with a VCA-based solution. VCA, if you don't know, is short for Voltage Controlled Amplifier. It does exactly what we're looking for, adjusting the volume of an input signal in response to a given control voltage. Thankfully, I did already come up with a couple VCA designs, so we can just use one of those. My diode-based implementation seems like a great fit, as it is really quite simple. Here's what it looks like after I tinkered with it a little to make it fit our specific needs. And while this might seem like a lot at first glance, the functional core is just this string of six diodes with a 100k resistor attached to its central node. Here's how it works. We apply a scaled down version of our input signal to the resistor, the control voltage to the top of the diode string and an inverted copy to the bottom. The output can then be picked up from the central node. If the control voltage is zero, the output will be identical to the input. That's because there is no current flowing, neither through the diodes nor through the resistor, since the input is not strong enough to push or pull the diodes open. And if a voltage is not allowed to transform into current, it's preserved as is. This is why we need to scale the input down, by the way. Because if it's too loud, it opens the diodes in this scenario, which would result in noticeable distortion. Okay, now if we bump the control voltage to 2 volts, the diodes are wide open and a large current flows from top to bottom. Since this is essentially a 50% voltage divider, the central node will sit at 0 volts, exactly halfway between top and bottom voltage. Now if the input signal goes above or below 0 volts, a current flows through the resistor. But since that current is so much smaller than the one flowing through the diodes, the central node voltage will remain almost unaffected. The signal is basically washed away, if you will, and the output stays silent. So in summary, the more current flows through the diodes, the more we reduce the output volume. Looking at the circuit as a whole again, we can see that everything else is just there to support this mechanism. First, we scale the input signal down with a voltage divider. Then, we buffer it and apply it to the 100k resistor. Next, we buffer the incoming CV before inverting it and then applying both versions to our string of diodes. The 1k resistor here is just to limit the maximum amount of current we push through the diodes. Wouldn't want to overdo it, right? Finally, we pick up the output from the central node, and then amplify it to reverse the downscaling at the input. If you've been wondering why we use a string of six diodes instead of just two, here's the reason. We want to keep the gain of this amplifier as low as possible to prevent random noise from creeping into the output. Multiple diodes in series are much harder to open, which means that we can apply a louder input signal without risking distortion. In turn, the output stage doesn't need as much gain to restore the signal. And that's it. Now by increasing the CV, we can decrease the output volume, which is exactly what we were looking for. To test this out, I've already set the circuit up on my breadboard. With this potentiometer, I can dial in a control voltage between 0 and 3 volts. Right now, it's turned down all the way, so our drum beat is passed through as is. And here's what happens if I turn it up. Great, so we've got the first block down. Next, we'll tackle the volume detector. For that, we'll first have to define what we mean when we talk about volume in this case. 
Here's what a single snare drum hit looks like when viewed on an oscilloscope. The line in the middle marks ground level, zero volts. As is typical for audio signals, the snare oscillates around that line. Now, strictly speaking, you'd determine the volume of this sound by measuring the height of the waveform at any given point, top to bottom. But since audio signals, this one included, are often roughly symmetrical, we can take a little shortcut here. Instead of measuring top to bottom, we'll simply discard the lower half and treat the distance between the current peak and ground as the absolute volume reading. This will save us lots of headaches when we go to implement it. Okay, so that's the y-axis. We also need to talk about the x-axis though. And that's because the answer to the question, how loud is this sound currently, depends heavily on what we mean by currently. At this scale, for this part of the waveform, the approximate answer would be 5 volts. But if we zoom in on the x-axis by a lot, that answer changes. Because now we get wildly different volume levels directly next to each other that we can't simply round up to an approximate value. And that's of course due to the fact that sounds are oscillations. And it means that in order to get a useful answer to our question, we have to measure the sound's volume over a significant period of time. How do we pull that off? Easy, with a circuit called a peak detector, which consists of just three components. A diode, a capacitor, and a resistor. If you set them up like this and send your audio signal into the diode, you can pick up its current volume level on the other side. Here's how it works. Whenever the input rises significantly above the zero volts line, a large current is pushed through the diode and into the capacitor, filling it up. Once the voltages on both sides are almost the same, the current flow will stop. We've sampled the current volume level. Next, when the input voltage drops, the charge inside the cap will very slowly drain out through the resistor. This is how we measure the voltage level over an extended period of time. Because if the input signal is returning to the same peak in rapid succession, the voltage at our capacitor will stay roughly constant. And once that peak drops for a while, the excess current will drain out and the voltages equalize. For this to work properly, we'll need to find the right values for both the cap and resistor though. If they're very small, the time interval we're looking at will be very short, and vice versa. In my experiments, combining a 10k resistor with a 10 microfarads capacitor gave me the best results. To demo this, I've set up the peak detector up here, and I'm feeding it RVCA's output. On the oscilloscope, you can see the input signal in yellow and the peak detector's output in blue. Unfortunately, it's not quite working as expected. There's this really noticeable gap between the signal's peaks and the volume we detect, especially for the smaller bumps. What's up with that? Well, we can actually blame the diode here. Because as we saw earlier, diodes will only let current pass through if the input voltage is significantly higher than the output voltage. This means that our capacitor can never be charged to the input signal's actual peak level, simply because the current flow will stop prematurely. To fix this, we can make use of a nifty trick involving another op-amp. If we combine it with our diode like this, we get rid of the gap between the signal's peak and the capacitor voltage. That's because the op-amp will simply increase its output voltage until the two input voltages are equal, neutralizing the voltage drop across the diode in the process. And here's how that works in practice. As expected, the blue line now matches the signal's peaks much more closely. Great. So that's the second block down. Just one more to go. Here, we want to compare the current volume level to a variable threshold and decide if it's above or below, and by how much. This sounds more tricky than it actually is, though, because all we need is simple subtraction. If we take the detected peak and subtract the threshold from it, then the result will tell us all we need to know. A positive result means we're above the threshold. A negative one means we're below it with the absolute value telling us by how much in both cases. Now, how do we implement this? 
Thankfully, voltage subtraction is yet another operation that op amps can help us with, even if the setup is a little more involved than, say, a simple buffer. Since I've already explained the mechanics behind this circuit in detail in another video, I'll skip it here. You can find a timestamped link to that video in the description. The basic gist is this, though. The op amp will subtract voltage 1 from voltage 2, and then set its output to the result of that calculation. So all we need now is a variable threshold voltage. For that, we'll simply set up another potentiometer as a variable voltage divider. Since we don't expect our input signal peaking at anywhere near 12 volts, it makes sense to restrict its range somewhat. Otherwise, the knob would have a huge dead zone. If we put a 20k resistor between the potentiometer and the positive rail, we pin the maximum threshold to 6 volts which should give us a comfortable amount of headroom, considering that the highest expected value in a Eurorack synthesizer is 5 volts. And here's how the result looks on my oscilloscope. The blue line now shows us the output of our subtractor op-amp, which I'm feeding a 3 volts threshold. As expected, we get these positive bumps whenever the input signal crosses it, and negative ones when it doesn't. Great. So that's the final block done. Now we just need to send the subtractor's output into the VCA's CV input. Because then, whenever the input signal crosses the set threshold, the subtractor will send out a positive voltage, which in turn reduces the VCA's gain. Conversely, if the output is below the threshold, the subtractor sends out a negative voltage, which allows the input to pass through the VCA unchanged. That's because current cannot flow through the diode string in reverse. So the VCA basically just ignores negative CV inputs. Great, let's see if this works as expected. The blue line shows us the currently set threshold. Let's see what happens as I move it downwards. The big peaks are actually reduced in volume, though weirdly they're not capped at the threshold. Instead, there's a prominent gap between the threshold and the peaks. What's up with that? Well, this is, again, the diode's fault. To understand why, let's analyze the feedback loop we created here. We'll assume that the signal input is fixed at 5 volts, while the threshold is set to 4 volts. Now, what we'd hope to see is that the circuit reduces the VCA's gain until the output is equal to the threshold. But there's a rather glaring issue with that. Because if the currently detected peak was the same as the set threshold, our subtractor's output would be 0 volts. Which, in turn, means that the VCA just allows the signal to pass through unchanged. But this clashes with our previous assumption. If the output volume is not reduced, it's obviously not equal to the 4 volts threshold. So what happens in reality is that the feedback loop settles on a kind of compromise where the difference between detected peak and threshold is just big enough to drive a substantial amount of current through our VCA's diode string. If that sounds confusing, let's do a little thought experiment. For that, we'll plot the VCA's input, the subtractor's output, and the VCA's output side by side. Let's say we slowly raise the input voltage from 3 to 5 volts, while the threshold stays fixed at 4 volts. As soon as the input crosses the 4 volts line, the subtractor's output starts going positive. But since the diodes in our VCA don't conduct at these low CV levels, there won't be any impact on its output voltage. Only once the subtractor's output is high enough to drive a significant amount of current through those diodes will we see an effect on the VCA's output volume. And from that point on, it quickly stagnates, along with the subtractor's output. Here, we've reached the compromise I mentioned before. So this explains the gap between threshold and signal we saw on the oscilloscope. But is there anything we can do about it? Thankfully, there is. We just have to make sure that our VCA's diodes turn on instantly when the CV input starts going positive. For that, we can fall back on what we've learned last time a diode gave us trouble. Remember how we put that diode inside this buffer's feedback path to neutralize the voltage drop across it? 
This worked because the op amp has to turn on the diode before the voltage on the other end can rise by any significant amount. We can apply the same idea here and force the CV input buffer to turn on the entire diode string. Here's how that works. We add in a string of three diodes followed by a 100k resistor to ground between the buffer's output and its inverting input. Then, when the voltage at the non-inverting input rises slightly above ground level, the op-amp is forced to increase its output voltage enough to turn on all three diodes. Okay, but why three diodes and not six? Because our dual buffer setup effectively doubles the voltage applied across the diode string. And the turn-on voltages of diodes in series simply get summed together. So, two times the turn-on voltage for three diodes in series is equal to the turn-on voltage of six diodes in series. There's just one small problem with this setup though. If the CV input goes below zero volts, the buffer will crash down to the negative rail in a vain attempt to pull current through the diodes. To prevent this, we simply add in one single diode facing the other direction. And here's how our circuit performs with this adjustment. While the gap is definitely reduced, there's something weird going on with our output signal as a whole. It sounds pretty distorted. This shouldn't surprise us though, since our compressor now reacts really violently when the signal crosses the threshold. So what's the remedy? Easy. Relax a bit on the compression ratio. To do that, we just have to scale down the feedback we apply to the VCA. Because if we cut it down by, say, 50%, then the gap between detected peak and threshold has to be twice as big before the VCA fully clamps down on the output volume. To implement this, we'll simply set up a variable voltage divider at the VCA CV input. This will allow us to adjust the compression ratio on the fly by turning a knob. And here's how that works out in practice. As expected, the output is allowed to push further and further beyond the set threshold, and the distortion disappears. But there's a small issue with this setup. The useful part of the potentiometer's range is crammed into the first 5%. After this, turning it further barely affects the compression ratio at all. This actually makes a lot of sense though. Because as we said earlier, setting the voltage divider to 50% means that the initial tiny gap between peak and threshold is allowed to double. But doubling a tiny value will give you a still tiny result. Only once we get up to factors of 20 and above will we see a noticeable change. Luckily, we can counteract this exponential relation if we use a logarithmic pot as our variable voltage divider, instead of a linear one. And yeah, this gives us much finer control over the compression ratio. Great. Now there's just two more controls to figure out. Attack and release. Thankfully, both are really straightforward to implement in our current setup. Let's start with the release dial. As we said before, the release tells the compressor how long it should wait before restoring the output volume once the input drops back below the threshold. Conveniently, we've already set a release time for our compressor when we constructed the peak detector. Remember how we added this 10k resistor to ground to measure volume over an extended period of time? This works because it delays the drop of the detected peak down to the actual output volume. And since the detected peak is what determines the amount of compression we apply, a delayed drop there directly results in an extended release time. So all we have to do is replace this 10k resistor with a 100k potentiometer and we've got our release dial. Right? Well, almost. We also need to set a minimum resistance, because otherwise we'd create a short circuit at the pot's minimum setting. In my experiments, a 4K7 resistor worked best here. Go any lower and the release is so short that the output gets seriously distorted. <laughs> 
Great, so let's hear how this sounds in practice. The blue line is showing us the output of the peak detector. Seems to work fine to me. At the shortest release setting, we get some noticeable distortion. If you dislike that, you can simply increase the baseline resistance. Now, for the attack dial, the same idea applies in reverse. If we want the compression to kick in later, we just have to slow down the capacitor's charging process. And we do that, you guessed it, by putting a potentiometer between the diode and the capacitor. Here's how this sounds using a 10k pot. While it does work in principle, fast attack times don't sound quite as snappy as I had hoped. Thankfully, I found a simple fix for that. The problem is that in our current setup, with a non-zero attack time dialed in, the speed of the charging process is not fixed. Instead, it gets slower exponentially as the cap fills up. So our compression kicks in gradually, which causes the lack of snappiness. To fix this, we'll include the potentiometer in the buffer's feedback path. Then the op-amp will blast the diode and resistor with 12 volts until the capacitor is charged to the input voltage. This brute force approach results in an almost linear looking charging process, which should cause the compression to kick in more sharply. And yeah, that sounds a lot snappier. Though the range is a bit limited for anything other than drums. So let's replace the 10k potentiometer with a 100k. As you can see, we can now dial in much longer attacks. Great. So with this, our compressor is basically finished. But we're not done just yet. I've got a fun bonus feature for you. Ever heard of a technique called sidechaining? It's when you control the compressor with a secondary signal instead of its own output. So peaks in that secondary signal will cause the main signal to drop in volume. Trying this with our circuit is as easy as breaking the feedback loop and attaching a jack socket to the peak detector. Then the compression is triggered by whatever we feed into that socket. Sounds great. And we basically got it for free. So with this, our basic compressor is finally done. Let me know in the comments if there are features you'd like to see me add in a future video. Until then, be sure to check out my Patreon page. You can support the channel there and get a bunch of bonus content in return. Anyways, thanks for watching and until next time. See ya.